Hello and welcome back. In this video, we will wrap up our discussion of the envelope rejection method by discussing some extra aspects. For example, we'll discuss efficiency of the method, so how fast it is, and we will discuss what makes a good proposal distribution for generating the original samples before we reject. So let's jump straight on. So now that we have seen how the method can be used with the help of an example, I want to discuss some more specialized aspects of the important sampling method. The first one is to do with the choice of the proposal density G. So there are various concerns. The first one is the obvious concern. G is the density we use for our proposal, so we must be able to efficiently generate samples from the density G. If we can't do that, then we just cannot apply the method. But there is also an actual constraint not to do with efficiency. Namely, we must have that the given density we want to generate samples from must be enveloped by G. So we must have f of x less than or equal to G of x for all x. And part of it is easy to see in a plot. So we discuss this plot here. And here we see what we then also found when doing it theoretically. There is some constraint here. We need to be sure that the blue curve is above the black curve. And if we choose C optimally, C will touch here. But there is a second constraint which we haven't really discussed. Namely, for x to infinity, that curve, the f, will go to 0 and g will go to 0. So in this plot, if we go further out, the curves will look the same. But still, we need that f is less than or equal to c times g. So we need to say something about the behavior and f of f and g as they both go to infinity. And what we need here is we need a distribution g, which has what is called heavier tails than f. So in particular, g must have heavier tails than f. And let me write what that means. It means we cannot have cases where the limit as we go to infinity of g of x over f of x goes to zero. So g cannot go to zero faster than f does, else we have no chance to satisfy the constraint f must be less than or equal to c times g. So let me just do two examples. One is what we just have done for the normal distribution. The f was proportional to e to the minus x square over 2. And g was proportional to e to the minus lambda x. And, well, we worked out the ACC, so we were fine. But the thing I'm discussing here is what happens for large x. And for large x, we see e to the minus x squared decays faster than e to the minus x. So f decays faster as x goes to infinity, which means that is OK. We are good. Now, let's just do a counterexample where it doesn't work. If we want to do the power law type of distribution, say f decays like 1 over x to the beta for large x. And if we try the same g, so say g is e to the minus lambda x, let's assume x is just positive, then that is not OK, because this one, 1 over polynomial, decays slower. So the consequence is here we cannot find the c. So that choice would not be OK. So if we want to generate power law distributions, we would either need to choose a different g, or what we rather should be doing is we should be using the inverse transform method in the first place here, because that is simply enough. We can work out the CDF and the inverse of it. So that was the first aspect I wanted to discuss. You need to not only look at the plot of f and g, which will only show kind of the middle bit, but you need to also think about the tails. And before you do the maths, you can already sometimes see which g's are good or not, not good, just based on the tail behavior. g must have heavier tails, which means it needs to go to zero slower or with the same speed as f does. So in the second aspect I want to mention is the efficiency of the method. By this I mean we are generating all of these proposals and typically most of them will be thrown out and generating proposals costs time. So we want to avoid waste here. And we have seen on average we need C over ZF proposals to generate one output sample. And ZF is part of the problem. It's a constant we normally don't know, but it is a property of F, so we cannot change this for a given F. But C, we have some influence over. And there are two things we can do. First, we have already discussed. Namely, we should optimize C for given G, F and G. We should minimize C for 
given f and g. And we have seen what that means. So in our example, f looked a bit like that, and g looked a bit like that. So, and if that's c times g, we can use c to move this curve up and down. And by choosing a small c, we move the blue curve down until it touches f. So that's what we should be doing, and that's what we saw in the example there we had achieved this. So sometimes you cannot exactly work out which c does this, but then you can do a slightly larger one to be sure. But if there's a choice, you should move c times g as close to f as possible, as long as it's above. But there's a second aspect to it, namely g should have a similar shape to f. And by this I mean, say, f is this. I just made up a curve. Then we can look at two candidates, g. So if g is like this, it fits quite snugly. Whereas if g is like this, even if it's like we had it, something which is positive here, we still need to scale it up by a ridiculous amount. There is at least a factor of 20, I would say, to get c times g above f. So if there are any kind of areas in g which have more mass than others, they should coincide with the areas of f where f has more mass than others. So that g, I would say, is bad, and that g here is good. And the test is always how small a c can you find for the given g. And here the red curve g will allow for a much smaller c than the blue curve g. So when you choose your proposal distribution, it may still be good to look at the plot of f to get a sense of what g would be good. Great, and this is what I wanted to say about section 1.4.2, and that concludes our discussion of this section. Thank you all for listening.